Mr. Jalil Abbas Jelani was a career Pakistan service officer who served as ambassador to Brussels, Canberra, and Washington, D.C. He also served as principal undersecretary or deputy foreign minister at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the government of Pakistan. Mr. Jalani was born on February 2, 1955 in Multan in the north central region of Pakistan. He earned his Bachelor of Law degree and an MS in Defense and Strategic Studies and joined the Pakistan's Foreign Service in 1979. His ambassadorial assignments uh, includes a service at the Pakistan Mission in Jeddah, London, New Delhi, and Washington, D.C. Following a tour of duty in India, Mr. Jalani was appointed the Ministry's Director for South Asia and South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, an organization of eight countries in the region in 2003. In 2005, he also acted as the Ministry's spokesperson. In 2007, Mr. Jelani was appointed as High Commissioner of Pakistan to Australia, serving there until 2009. Later, he served as Pakistan's envoy to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the European Union. In 2012, he became the Principal Undersecretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Islamabad, the top civil service official in the ministry. He served for almost two years and later joined Pakistan's embassy in Washington as Ambassador of Pakistan for the period of 2013 to 2015. Ever since his retirement in 2015, he has been proactively continuing with academic and professional endeavors and representing Pakistan in official and private capacities at various local and international fora, seminars, roundtables, and eminent think tanks on the issues of regional and global concern, as well as on Jammu and Kashmir, Afghanistan, South Asia's regional dynamics, etc. In 2018, he was selected among three candidates to be the Interim Prime Minister of Pakistan during the interregnum for the general elections in July 2018. Also joining us today is Pakistan's Ambassador to the Philippines, Dr. Imtais Ahmad Kazi. He is a career diplomat with over three decades of experience. He assumed his responsibilities as Ambassador of Pakistan to the Philippines on August 12, 2018. Prior to his appointment as ambassador to the Philippines, Dr. Kazi served as director general and directing staff at the National Defense University in Islamabad from 2017 to 2018. And prior to that, as director general for policy planning and public diplomacy at the Foreign Office in Islamabad from 2015 to 2017. Dr. Kazi also served as consul general of Pakistan in Frankfurt from 2012 to 2015. He holds degrees of MBBS, LLB, MA, and MIPP from the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. He has translated Sufi poetry to Kayam, Hafiz Shirazi, Bulay Shah, and Shah Bihitai in, ver in versified English, some of which have been published from Tehran and Islamabad. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. I am Dante Han, the President and CEO of the Manila Times. Uh, Ambassador Jelani, if I may call you that, or should I call you Minister Jelani? What is the... Ambassador Jelani is good enough. Okay, <laughs> thank you, yes. sir. And Ambassador Kazi, good morning, Your Excellency. Okay, sir, uh, we'd like to talk to you about uh, Afghanistan, which has been in global media for the past several weeks, as you know. Before we get started with our questions, perhaps you can give us an update being, you know, um, Sure. There, uh, you know, uh, from in Islamabad, what is what is the latest that is going on uh, from your vantage point? Well, you know, um, certainly uh, the developments since 15th August, they surprised everybody. It mm -hmm. surprised um, the international community. It surprised the uh, previous government in Afghanistan. And also it surprised even the Taliban, for that matter, because... Uh, Nobody was expecting that uh, uh, the Afghan army would just sort of uh, not fire a single shot. The, um, uh, the previous government would collapse like a house of cards. And the commander in chief, the president, he would just flee the country um, even before the Taliban entered the um, capital, Kabul. So that is um, something which is absolutely um, surprising for everybody. But then the speed with which Taliban, they overwhelmed the um, entire country, that also defied all projections. The Afghan government, the US administration, senior military commanders, all major think tanks, and also strategic analysts around the world, I would say, 
they had um, um, they said they thought um, that Afghan forces who were well trained they would be able to uh, blunt the Taliban uh, uh, advances into the capital, but uh, and so that's see. And uh, now, uh, unfortunately, after the uh, situation, after the takeover of, of, of Taliban, uh, while there is an in-depth analysis going on, at the same time, uh, you know, rather than focusing on the real issues uh, or to think about the uh, plight of the common man in, Af in Afghanistan, uh, this some kind of a blame game has started. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden administration blaming uh, uh, the Trump administration for having initiated a dialogue and signing an agreement with the uh, uh, with Taliban. Uh, 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 previous Trump administration blaming uh, uh, Biden administration for uh, the abrupt withdrawal. Uh, U.S. blaming the previous government of Taliban of Ashraf Ghani uh, of um, corruption and mismanagement and also failure to uh, develop an internal consensus in support of the... So, you know, this is uh, something which is going on. Some mm -hmm. people are also trying to put blame in Pakistan that Taliban victory uh, in Afghanistan is also on account of uh, uh, Pakistan's support to Afghan Taliban. Uh, well, this is something which is um, an easy kind of a... Um, kind of a... Kind of a uh, you know, it's, we see it as a scapegoating because mm -hmm. Taliban, um, you know, a, a group of people who had already occupied uh, almost 70% of the territory of Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. was engaged with them since 2014. All the international community was engaged with them since uh, for a very long time. And um, they also had been de accorded defected, de facto uh, recognition by almost everybody. So, you know, in this kind of a situation, blaming Pakistan is something which we uh, find it very surprising and also uh, puzzling. Um, so th 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 these are some of these things. I think the, uh, um, uh, the uh, I think the real focus from our point of view should be the people of uh, uh, Afghanistan. Now, the current situation is that with the Taliban takeover, while um, everybody is engaged with them, in, including the United States of America, the European countries, uh, China, uh, Russia, um, Iran, Central Asian Republics, they're all talking to Taliban. But then the financial assistance, which is badly needed for uh, the Afghan Taliban, that is not forthcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, World Bank assistance has stopped. The IMF was supposed to release uh, $460 million. They have not... Uh, uh, that has not been released. The Afghanistan had uh, uh, funds in the United States of America, close to $10 billion, which is also frozen. Uh, the donor countries had pledged last year that they would uh, give uh, $12 billion spread, spread over um, four years uh, to Taliban uh, government. So that is also frozen. So, you know, the money is not coming in. So it's a situation is moving towards a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also apprehensions uh, on the part of the international community uh, that whether they have, uh, uh, they, that Taliban will be, will prove to be an honest uh, interlocutors, whether they will be able to sever their links with the uh, terrorist organizations, whether they will be able to, um, uh, to respect rights of women. So, uh, um, so, you know, these are some of the concerns which are being expressed by the international community. But then um, I think the um, priorities that Taliban, they have announced, they include, um, one is to seek international legitimacy and recognition. Mm -hmm. They would like to have retained public um, um, uh, goodwill internally, and um, also they would like to engage in social welfare activities. Uh, they also have indicated they would... Um, form an inclusive government, which mm -hmm. is something which is being demanded by the international community. They also have said that they will ensure that Afghanistan soil is not used for uh, uh, to destabilize other countries, as was the case previously in the last 20 years. 
and they would uh, also economic well-being also remain um, kind of a priority for them. Uh, they have uh, taken some good steps. Uh, they have announced that women would be allowed to uh, to uh, to um, uh, work as well as to receive education up to university education. But obviously, it would be a segregated segregated education, uh, keeping in view the uh, the um, uh, you know socio cultural norms of Afghanistan. Uh, they have also uh, announced general amnesty for everybody, including uh, people who are working with the previous government, which is also, I think, is a positive development. Uh, they are the leadership, uh, Taliban leadership is, uh, from our point of view, is very mature. They have, um, okay. they have gained sufficient experience of diplomacy also. The way they uh, successfully signed uh, agreement with the US last year or, or, or earlier, I think the, the, those agreements were also uh, something which uh, uh, speaks highly about uh, their uh, diplomatic skills as well. So, you know, these are some of the uh, uh, things uh, which are happening. In our view, it would be unrealistic to um, expect that Taliban will complete, uh, will um, transform completely overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, their leadership may have adopted a moderate uh, kind of a stance, but then the lower cadres they still uh, kind of um, hold on to some of the um, previous ideas. So it will take time before they will be able to um, uh, kind of uh, educate their people. Um, That's interesting. They, so these are some of the uh, developments in, um, you know, in our view, um, uh, we, uh, we, we have to see that there is a close linkage between good governance um, and also uh, economic uh, uh, resources. As mm -hmm. of now, to expect Taliban to, uh, uh, to demonstrate good governance while they do not have uh, a penny in their pocket, I think, again, this would be far-fetched. Um, I think if, uh, with the help of the international community, if some efforts is, are made to stabilize Afghanistan, to engage Taliban, probably, and to incentivize them to take uh, some positive steps, probably that would be the right approach that would be followed. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, I would say that the way forward uh, from our point of view would be, that rather than constantly talking about uh, managing a humanitarian crisis, which is uh, developing in, uh, in Afghanistan, I think we uh, international community must work to avert such a situation because that is something which is the most important. Mm -hmm. Every uh, Afghan has suffered a lot for the last 40 years. They continue to suffer. Uh, they have a shortage of funds. So accordingly, I think uh, it would be uh, only be prudent in case they are helped in some way, in one way or the other. And then um, there has to be a uh, mechanism of humanitarian uh, help and assistance, as well as development support under the auspices of uh, the United Nations. Uh, they have to ensure that Afghanistan remains stable and also basic needs of the people are met. Uh, we mark, you know, again, uh, you know, what. Pakistan feels is that we should not repeat the mistakes of the past 20 years. We should all uh, now look at the developments uh, or the realities on the ground. We should try and help with the situation. Uh, we have to accept that they are a reality. I am, um, uh, you know, one can, uh, the, the European countries, I have strong reason to believe that they are also uh, getting, getting around to the same point of view. Um, I was uh, reading, uh, Angela Merkel last week when she said that uh, uh, Taliban are, are a reality and we have to work with them. Um, uh, I think the Britishers and other European countries have also said the same thing. So small amount of money has started to trickle down, but then probably that is not enough. It is the question of paying the salaries of the uh, civil servants to provide uh, essential items to the people. Training capacity building of Taliban is something which is of uh, importance. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, I, I've seen uh, some interviews of your Prime Minister Imran Khan who used the same word incentivize uh, in, in, in um, 
uh, in, in, in a suggested approach to the Taliban. Um, what would be the consequence, do you think, if, if, if the Taliban cannot hold the government? What, 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 is, the, what is the consequence? Will, will there be civil war in Afghanistan? Are there any challengers there? Or what would be the other consequences if, if um, the, the world does not step up and, and, and try to, uh, I guess, in a say, help the Taliban uh, form and hold a government? Well, you know, the obviously, uh, in case Taliban, who now, for, I think for the first time in the, uh, um, in the history of Afghanistan, so, you know, in the last uh, kind of at least uh, two or three decades or so, one group which is in control of the whole of Taliban is Afghanistan is Taliban. So in case they are unable to take uh, uh, hold of Afghanistan, obviously it would lead to civil war as you have rightly pointed out. But the other consequence which is uh, more dangerous is that the conflict is likely to spill over to other countries as well. I see. Uh, number three, I think the, it will give, provide space to um, international terrorist groups who have already, already made uh, Afghanistan as a base for them. So, you know, this is a situation which is certainly not uh, uh, favorable to anybody. I think for the regional countries, for uh, the international community, because all kinds of groups are present in Afghanistan, terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda is regrouping itself. ISIS is uh, becoming stronger in Afghanistan. Um, ETIM uh, is very strong there. Um, IUM uh, is very, IUM is this terrorist organization which threatens Central Asian republics. So these are the groups which are uh, getting stronger. And then there is a TTP which is a threat to Pakistan. So this is, these are the groups who will, who can create a lot of problem. Mm -hmm. Not only uh, a civil war will ensue, but then uh, Afghanistan, instability in Afghanistan will create instability in other countries. And lastly, I think that instable situation in Afghanistan will all also give a, an opportunity to other countries to meddle in the affairs of uh, Afghanistan which is also not conducive for a peaceful region and peaceful Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, I heard your prime minister also mention the term Pashtun nationalism. Not, mm -hmm. you know, not many Filipinos understand the, the, the ethnic groups in, in Afghanistan, but I also heard him say, correct me if I'm wrong, that there are now more Pashtuns living on Pakistan side of the border than there are on Afghanistan. So obviously this is, a concern for your country, but maybe if you can help us understand what is the significance of uh, Pashtun nationalism and how could that play into what we are seeing now in Afghanistan? You know, there are two aspects to this Pashtun nationalism. One is that in Afghanistan, Pashtuns, they form about 50%, 50 to 60% of the population of Afghanistan. In the last 20 years, the um, power was centered on non-Pashtuns. So accordingly, there was a sense of deprivation amongst the Pashtuns of Afghanistan. Uh, Taliban are Pashtuns. <laughs> they, they say that all, all Taliban are Pashtuns. All Pashtuns may not be Taliban. So you know, that's, the, that's the, but the point is that they would also have sympathies for any group which would speak for their rights. So the uh, Taliban are also seen as some kind of a, an entity that speaks for the rights of the Pashtuns. Now, in Pakistan also, we have a very large Pashtun population. Mm -hmm. Our uh, four, uh, you know, our, um, um, out of four provinces, uh, there are two provinces where we have, one province is 100% Pashtun, and the other province is about 50% Pashtun in Pakistan. It's a large population Pashtun. So they obviously, they have their sympathies with the, um, with the Afghan Pashtuns, because who, who were completely sidelined in the last 15, 20 years. They may have appointed one president who is a Pashtun, but the real powers are uh, rest, you know, rested with the other, uh, other groups. So you know, that's the kind of a situation that existed. So I think probably this is something that um, uh, the prime minister was referring to. Um, I think the, uh, 
this is this is certainly an important aspect that uh, has come into play in the um, in the successes that have been achieved by by Afghan Taliban. But we have to real, you know realize one thing mm -hmm. at this time the Afghan Taliban they uh, they followed a totally different strategy strategy in the sense that they their first focus when they started making advances they started making advances in non pashtun areas i see uh, so so they they first made inroads in non pashtun areas they uh, kind of took control of those areas with the help of the locals and then they came down to the pashtun areas so you know i thought that this strategy that they uh, developed was also very very uh, very uh, kind of uh, successful for them one thing that we have to realize that in all the non pashtun areas that they have taken control of they have appointed the locals as as the governors uh, you know, of those ethnic groups so which is i think is also a smart strategy that is being followed by them in order to take control but then the uh, the real issue would be the economic uh, meltdown that afghanistan is faced with so in case there is an economic meltdown then uh, we should not expect good governance as right. uh, we should not ex expect uh, uh, kind of any developmental activities we should also not expect any uh, any uh, you know a kind of a, a kind of stability that one would wish afghanistan to have in the days to come Okay. Uh, you know, when, when we follow the news about Afghanistan and they, they, they mention the term, you know, inclusive government, they most always, almost always refer to including women in, in the government. But I was wondering, you know, just pursuing this line of questioning about the, the ethnic groups, do you, do you see um, the Tajiks, for example, the Baloch, are they, are they being included, you think, in this new government that we might see formed by the Taliban? Well, in the current uh, cabinet, which is an interim cabinet, mm -hmm. um, they have included five non-Pashtuns in the uh, cabinet. They are Chittajiks, they are Uzbeks, and other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. But you know, the kind of um, uh, discussions which are taking place uh, between the international community, the international community and Pakistan also, our position is in line with the international community, with the US and other countries is, and, in, and that is the position with Russia and China as well. That I think everybody would want um, to have stability and for stability, it is extremely important if other ethnic groups are also provided given equal representation in a, you know, as proportion to their um, population uh, in the government in the, so that's basically the success of any government uh, that uh, in case you wish to ensure. Mm -hmm. So I think they, uh, the um, uh, Taliban, we have reason to believe that they are also making efforts in that direction. Mm -hmm. But then um, uh, one thing is very clear that there are many people who are sitting in the fence. I'm talking about some of the non-Pashtuns. They are looking at the reaction of the international community. They are look, also looking as to what kind of um, uh, finances, financial support is coming from the other side. So in case there is a, uh, there is a development in that direction, perhaps things would get better for, the, for, uh, for, for Afghanistan. Um, in any case, my own sense, I have served in Europe, I have served in many, many countries as ambassador. Uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to form a coalition government. Yes. I was in Brussels as ambassador, and I remember that in, uh, in 2010, when elections took place in Brussels, it took them almost two years to form the government. It remained an interim setup. Uh, it becomes sometimes difficult to... Um, to have that kind of a, uh, a development, you know, to have a coalition government. All right. I, I think we know a little bit of what you mean uh, based on our politics here in the Philippines. <laughs> Ambassador, um, do you, if, if, the, if the West, mainly Europe and the United States, don't, don't come into uh, Afghanistan's aid, do you, do you see China, Russia, Iran filling that void? 
Uh, filling a void of uh, what? Well, you know, coming into coming into the economic assistance of Afghanistan. If if that assistance is not forthcoming from Europe and the United States, do you think that China, Iran, and Russia might fill in that 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 need for Afghanistan? Well, they are trying to uh, to help uh, Afghanistan, but I don't think they will be able to fill the void. I see. Has. Uh, has started to give uh, free oil to the new dispensation in Afghanistan. Okay. The uh, oil is being um, given to uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, rather, they have doubled the uh, uh, the supply of oil to to Afghanistan in the last two three weeks, so that the government machinery continues to run. Similarly, um, uh, food assistance is being given by Russia, food assistance is being given by China. We have also uh, sent uh, um, four plane loads of food supplies and medicines to Afghanistan. But you know, the point is that the, uh, this will perhaps not be able to replace the kind of uh, support that was coming from the international community. For instance, mm -hmm. $460 million was to come from the IMF. So that is uh, that is frozen. World Bank had to had to give some money. That is frozen. So those were substantial amounts. Then the donor countries, uh, which they you know the decision uh, that was made last year, they were supposed to give three billion dollars per annum to finance policing, to finance security, to finance the salaries of the civil servants, to for de other developmental activities. So that is also suspended. So uh, that that they will not be able to fill the void. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have a feeling that um, uh, the uh, the best way forward would be a cooperative arrangement. The reason is reason is that if um, China or Russia, they will. Um, probably take a more proactive role, or for that matter, Iran will take a more proactive role in the context of Afghanistan, then the kind of international legitimacy that uh, uh, that Taliban, um, they would want for themselves, that may become a little more challenges because of the reaction that will come from the other European countries, or for that matter, the United States of America. Uh, so that's uh, something which is which we I think probably we have to take that that into account as well. Well, I know things are still fluid in Afghanistan, but maybe you can tell us about Pakistan's policies toward Afghanistan. How how is it shaping up? Are, do you do you foresee a recognition of the Taliban government? And then are you talking to the United States and to Europe with regard to Afghanistan? Are you now the uh, that that middle person now trying to trying to see or try to move things forward. Well, uh, well, the, I think the, our position is aligned with the international community. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, when, when it comes to uh, the question of recognition of uh, Taliban government, my own, um, you know, this is a very common perception in all the regional countries that Taliban they have already got a de facto recognition de facto in the sense that um, um, U.S. had started negotiating with, them, yeah. negotiating with them for a very long time. And those negotiations ultimately culminated in, uh, in uh, Doha uh, giving, establishing an office of uh, Taliban in, in Qatar, in Doha. And then ever since Americans, the Europeans, all other countries, they were in negotiations with them. Then there is a Troika Plus, uh, which includes um, uh, uh, which includes Russia, China, uh, the United States of America, and Pakistan. We are also trying to include Iran in that grouping. Um, so they they are also talking to Taliban on a regular basis. So we recently, I think, another meeting is also coming up very soon. UN is engaged with them uh, for a very long time. UN is also engaged with them. With uh, some of the Taliban leaders who are also on the on the banned entities list of the United Nations, uh, the UN uh, uh, special representative uh, she, uh, she met uh, with the with Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is on the 
on the list, <laughs> on the banned entity, entities list. So, you know, these, uh, so that's why, so as far as the um, uh, de jure recognition is concerned, I think probably um, we will align our policy with the rest of the international community. We would like Afghan Taliban to form an inclusive government. We would like Afghan Taliban to respect international laws, international norms. And we would also expect them to demonstrate very, very clearly um, in some practical terms, they're, uh, you know, taking action against these organizations, uh, Afghanistan-based terrorist organizations, uh, so that, um, you know, they have already indicated that they will take, but we would like them to, to take some substantive steps against these people. Uh, so that's something which is, I think, uh, a very reasonable demand that is being made by us mm -hmm. as well as the international community. Uh, Ambassador, do you, do you think if the, uh, if the international community does not come to Afghanistan's aid now, do you think that that will drive the Taliban closer to some of those terrorist groups that you, that you mentioned earlier that are already operating there? Or do you think that uh, they're already in bed together and that, you know, uh, some say or some are saying that, you know, they are, they have trouble trusting the Taliban because of the, of that, of that relationship. I think um, my own feeling is that they had uh, kind of disconnected with these terrorist groups for a very long time. In mm -hmm. case they had not disconnected, then I think the U.S. and other European countries would not be talking to them. So this disconnection or their, you know, they had severed their links much earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, uh, one thing which is important is the practical demonstration of, uh, of taking some um, practical steps against those organizations. So that is something which is, which is yet to be seen. But then I think um, even in that uh, case, the Taliban argument would be that taking action against these organizations, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it is ISIS, whether it is other groups, it would also require capacity building and financial assistance. Because for any action, there is uh, certainly a reaction that would come from the other side, which, which, which would require a tremendous amount of resources. You know, we have been a country which has um, been a victim of terrorism. Your country has also been a victim of terrorism. Yes, for a long, very, very long time. And you know, when terrorist activities uh, take place, how much damage it causes to the life and property, and also uh, the kind of, it has a psychological impact on the people as well. Uh, we have suffered that greatly in the last uh, many, many years. But I think uh, Taliban would have, um, a, would be justified in saying that please help us in taking action against those organizations. Uh, they are, obviously they are not um, uh, sitting just, you know, idle. They also have um, capacity to fight back. So, but we need to have enough resources to take on those uh, uh, organizations. Uh, about, so, hmm. Ambassador, can you talk, tell us about, you know, the, the, the state of, of Pakistan's relationship with the US now? You mentioned earlier that there's a lot of blame game going on the, in the United States. They, of course, point to the number of soldiers they lost in Afghanistan. Uh, there has been very little said about, you know, the number of uh, deaths in Afghanistan, Afghanis who died, but none of them have mentioned the Pakistanis who also died in, in the war on, on terror. That must be very frustrating. But how is, um, how, 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 how is Pakistan now dealing with the U.S. or, or vice versa with regard to uh, this you know, with these developments. You know, um, uh, we have had a very strong relationship with the United States of America for a very long time. As a matter of fact, we were part of the, during the Cold War, we were part of the same alliance. Uh, but now the situation has begun to change. Unfortunately, um, you know, if you ask me, how do I assess the uh, nature of U.S.-Pakistan relations? I would say that... Uh, uh, as of now, we do not have very many strategic convergences between the two countries. 
But at the same time, I have strong reason to believe, having served as ambassador to Washington, having served as foreign secretary of Pakistan, I think we both need each other for the um, preservation and promotion of our respective interests. Pakistan is um, an important country, being a nuclear country. We also have a very strong role uh, in the Middle East, in the Islamic world. We have a strong role in this South Asia, and we have a, a strong role in Asia, Asia Pacific as well. Uh, we have in the past, you know, the current, uh, low, you know, low in our relations is perhaps one of the factors is the China factor. We have a close relationship with China. We have a strategic relationship with China. And we have a, a relationship of trust with China. But what we um, uh, have told the US side is that Pakistan has always played the role of a bridge between the US and China. Mm -hmm. If you recall in, 19, uh, in 1971, it was Pakistan who, because of our close relationship with both United States of America and China, we were able to play the role of a bridge and we brought about this rapprochement between the two countries, uh, US and um, China. Uh, you remember uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's visit to China, secret visit through Pakistan. And I think, and the previous, and uh, prior to that, the negotiations that uh, uh, were undertaken by Pakistan with the Chinese and with the, I think those are something which is a matter of record and history. Yeah, as well. We have told them that we would be very happy to play the same role uh, of playing a bridge or in case the situation comes to a point where we have to play that role, we will be very happy to play that role because we feel that uh, you know, playing that kind of a role is important uh, for many reasons uh, in the sense that uh, we uh, any confrontation between two important power centers would not be in the interest of either uh, the, uh, the Asian countries, or for that matter, the United States of America. Uh, the, uh, I think it will, be a, it will cause a major blow to uh, the economic progress that Asia has received in the last 40 years. Asia has been on the rise, whether it is, uh, um, you know, you name any country um, in Asia, and they have risen in the last 40 years. There has been no major uh, war in, in Asia in the last 40 years. And accordingly, um, uh, Asian, Asian countries, I think every Asian country would avoid a confrontation with them. And Pakistan certainly would like to play that kind of a role in uh, diffusing tension. Uh, we would like to have good relationship, but unfortunately, uh, there, are, there are some very, um, um, strong lobbies which have emerged um, uh, these days, you know, anti-China lobbies, um, uh, the uh, non-proliferation lobbies, um, oh, you know, you name any lobby mm -hmm. and they have their own vested interests and they, they would like to exploit the situation in order to create differences between uh, countries, otherwise peaceful, uh, peace-loving countries. Well, what, what do your contacts tell you? Do you think the United States is interested in, in having Pakistan play that role? Or are they just simply too tired already after, uh, after all that has happened in Afghanistan? They... No, I, I, I don't think they will. They, uh, the kind of profile that the United States has, mm -hmm. it, would, it would not like to disengage from South Asia. South Asia is too important. Um, and Pakistan is also too important. When I tell people uh, about Pakistan's geography, uh, they say that yes, uh, the geography that makes Pakistan very, very important. We, we share 2,700 kilometers long border with Afghanistan. We share 1,000 kilometers long border with Iran. We share almost 1,000 kilometers long border with China. And we share 2,900 kilometers long border with India. So just imagine which other country has such, uh, you know, two other nuclear powers as its neighbors. You know, this is, this is something which is, and then uh, we have a certain profile in the uh, Islamic countries. We have a certain profile in the, mm -hmm. the international organization. We play a very active role on, um, 
on major issues, whether it is uh, nuclear non-proliferation, whether it is climate change, whether it is health issues, whether it's um, um, uh, the, uh, you know, you, you name any, any important issue and Pakistan plays a very, very important role in that. And I think that would also require closer Pakistan and US uh, cooperation. One thing that I have, I would like to mention that I have always believed that there are some inherent strengths in Pakistan US relationship. Whenever there is a downturn in this relationship, uh, we have the capacity to come back on track very soon. And, um, and this is something that the Americans also realize. You asked if the, um, there is a willingness on the part of the Americans, I think uh, there may be posturing some time from some American uh, policy makers, but I think um, um, the, the, there, is, uh, there, is, there is definitely a desire on the part of the, of, uh, the, of the American policy makers to, to maintain a good relationship or to retain Pakistan's good goodwill. I may also mention one thing to you, that do you know that Pakistan for the last more than 40 years is also looking after Iranian interests in uh, the United States of America. So in other words, when you are doing I, that bridge as well. Huh? <laughs> that's right. And when I was ambassador of Pakistan and Iran uh, in Washington, I was also representing uh, Iran in Washington. So that's the kind of a role that we have played for the last uh, more than 40 years. Interesting. Joined here today by a couple of our other reporters, uh, Dempsey Reyes, who covers uh, our national defense, and Bernadette Tamayo, who covers foreign affairs. If you don't mind, I'd like to give them some time also to ask questions either Please. from you or Ambassador Kazi, who's also here because you know we want to take advantage of that opportunity as well. Maybe Please. we can start with Dempsey. Dempsey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ambassadors. Uh, about my question would be about the counterterrorism efforts, you know, by the Philippines, and particularly if there could be help coming from the international community, including the Pakistan. Recently, Japan has said that they that there was a terror threat lingering in six Southeast Asian countries, and I believe that those are your allied countries too, Myanmar. Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Thailand. Uh, can I ask uh, if Pakistan is interested with that kind of development? I mean, considering that the Philippines was also surprised with that kind of uh, report from Japan. And how do, what does it say to counterterrorism efforts with in the international community, do you think that there is a need on your side, on your end, of course, do you think that there is a need for the Philippines to improve its uh, <clears throat> uh, information sharing with other countries? Thank you. you no, know, I think this is, this is something which is very important. I think the uh, terrorism is certainly a major issue for every country in the world. And uh, these terrorists, they, they know no boundaries. And I think there has to be a cooperative uh, arrangement between all countries to, um, uh, to fight this menace. Um, I think there has to be an intelligence sharing mechanism between all countries. We recently had a meeting of the intelligence chiefs of the regional countries. The intelligence chiefs of Central, all Central Asian republics, they were here in Islamabad. The intelligence chief of Russia, the intelligence chief of China, and Iran and other countries, they were here in, in uh, Pakistan to basically discuss exactly the same thing that you are referring to, this um, to develop a kind of a joint mechanism to fight uh, terrorism, uh, this international. These terrorists, they have what their international links. One terrorist based in Pakistan may have linkages in other many other countries. So I think we need to develop that kind of a cooperative mechanism. We would, I think Pakistan would be very much interested in expanding this uh, uh, intelligence sharing mechanism with other countries also. Um, if you ask me, uh, we would certainly, um, uh, we had convened a meeting of intelligence chiefs of the regional countries only, um, the, who were you know, neighbors of Pakistan, 
in one way or the other. Uh, uh, neighbors of Pakistan and Afghanistan one way or the other. But I think this needs to be expanded to other Asian countries also. We need to have a uh, international uh, conference of and to develop a portal, a uh, portal um, whereby we are able to share information with regard to uh, to uh, the activities of these uh, organizations or anything that is picked up by any intelligence agency that should could be shared with that portal. So I think this is something which is of paramount importance. Uh, we should all be cooperating with each other. Uh, this is something which is which will not be tackled by only one country taking action against such forces. Do you think, sir, that the Philippines should be should join that kind of initiative that you're saying? I mean, do you do you think it's high time for us to join that initiative that you were saying? I mean, the in, intelligence sharing, the meeting that you have with the intelligence communities in different countries. Do you think that it's well, high time for us? Well, you know, Philippines is a very very important country. I know that Philippines has also suffered terrorism for a very long time. So uh, you know, say, I think Philippines should also, we have had very good relationship with Philippines and uh, we continue to have very good relationship. There is, uh, I have very strong reason to believe that these two, our two countries do cooperate, but, uh, but uh, on, these, on this issue, but we need to expand this cooperation uh, to a further uh, level. And I think, as I mentioned that um, other uh, countries in the region should also join this portal that I'm talking about. I think uh, that would be the best thing, uh, best way forward for all of us. That would be our thing. Uh, good afternoon, Ambassador Jelani and Ambassador Kasi. Uh, Ambassador Jelani, I have three questions for you. And these, uh, and these are the pharmaceutical industry in Pakistan. Uh, RCEP and Quad. Um, my first question is about the huge and successful pharmaceutical industry in Pakistan. Uh, with COVID-19 still wreaking havoc worldwide, uh, I was wondering whether Pakistan is interested in coming up with a partnership with the Philippines to manufacture uh, anti-COVID drugs such as uh, Tosili Zumok which is quite expensive here in the Philippines. Uh, Ambassador would, uh, Kazi, would you like to respond to this cooperation? I have, uh, you know, what I, whatever I know, I think um, uh, our side would be very happy to, um, to collaborate and cooperate with the pharmaceutical industry of uh, Philippines. The reason is that again, this is a humanitarian issue and we should be cooperating with each other. And um, uh, with this, you know, one should not hold back any information. If it, you have a good technology, one is, you have a good sort of uh, expertise, it should be shared with others. So that is the kind of uh, uh, vision that our prime minister also has to, uh, uh, to advance, uh, to, that whatever technology or whatever expertise we have, we sh particularly on the health issues, we should share it with the other countries. Um, but in practical terms, I think uh, Ambassador Kazi will be able to, uh, to um, basically elaborate as to what is what are the kind of steps which are which have been taken in order to, um, to promote this kind of cooperation. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. I just wanted to add that uh, the Sinopharm is the latest COVID-19 vaccine which is to be granted emergency use authorization by this FDA here in Philippines. And there's a Pakistani importer, Mr. Abdul Razak Siddiqui. He belongs to the famous Dedi group of Pakistan entrepreneurs and businessmen. They are two brothers. They are well settled here in Philippines for the last many decades. And they have given me a good news that they are, they have, they are, their company is two world traders. And is going to bring this vaccine once it receives the goal ahead signal from your government. The company also plans to bring in other vaccines because its goal is to be the biggest biological pharmaceutical supplier, especially in Philippines. They are very active for past many decades. Of course, we have our own limitations at the moment. In Pakistan, you see, we are 220 million people, almost double the size and population of Philippines. 
And we also started this uh, vaccines, multiple vaccines, including Chinese and the Americans. But we have covered almost 200 million of Pakistanis, so, uh, 20 million of Pakistanis so far. And we are in the process of completing our own vaccination. So there's not much export potential from Pakistan at the moment. But having said that, I would still say that this particular Pakistani company, two world traders, they have been keen, they were after it, they have brought it, they have given me good news, they have shared their brochures with me. They are in constant touch for a final approval from the president's office, Malakanyan. And we look forward, they are very hopeful, they are very optimistic, and they are keen to have this vaccination provided. Actually, I don't think you have started so far for the private sector, these vaccinations. But as and soon we receive this authorization, the Pakistani company, we are hopeful and looking forward that Pakistanis will play their role in having this vaccination sign of form. I'm very much hopeful in the coming days. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, can I, can I get again the name of the vaccine the produced in Pakistan? Yeah, that's Sinopharm, the Chinese vaccine Sinopharm. Uh, uh, Sinopharm, okay. okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Jelani, mm -hmm. about RCEP, uh, we understand that India exited from RCEP uh, I was wondering whether Pakistan is interested in filling the void uh, vacated by India. Yeah, uh, void vacated by India where? This is the ambassador, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the, the, the trade treaty that was signed, I believe, November last year. Yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. I was yes. wondering, we were wondering if, if Pakistan was interested in, in, in also joining that, that trade treaty. Well, um, um, I am absolutely sure that Pakistan would be very much interested in joining that uh, that forum. Um, I do not know I'm uh, because I am I have been out of the service now as to the mechanism whereby Pakistan would be able to join. But then uh, this is something that would certainly be uh, uh, be uh, would be you know is, should be look. Uh, under consideration by our respective ministry and the foreign office. I have absolutely no doubt. But in principle, I think um, going by our past interaction with the uh, with such uh, forums, I think uh, Pakistan would be very much interested in joining. Ambassador Kazi, have you heard anything? Uh, uh, I, or is, is, is Pakistan more interested in bilateral, bilateral uh, treaties at, 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 at for now? Well, to be honest, CERP is a very, very impressive forum, given the membership that it has. India has not joined it, although it was in the very lead in the, in the, in the initial talks and in the initial meetings. They have had some bad experiences with their bilateral treaties with ASEAN countries. They are rethinking about this because they, have, uh, they, have, they are ascertaining their positives, gains, and negatives in the last few decades. And uh, Pakistan certainly has always supported and welcome to join these things, but we have our own issues at the moment. We have our bilateral FTAs in the region with China. And as far as I remember, we had a comprehensive economic partnership agreement signed with Malaysia in 2009, when I was there as deputy high commissioner. We have also signed something in 2010 with Indonesia. We were in talks with Thailand also. So we have those bilateral ones, but in order to be eligible, as far as my knowledge is concerned, so far, although we have been having some webinars in the region, I have I have asked my commercial counselor to do some studies on this so that we, we further probe this subject. Uh, as long as we are not full partners, dialogue partners with ASEAN, all the countries of ASEAN which itself has its own regional comprehensive economic agreement in services, goods, and trade. I think the utility or benefits of joining the comprehensive regional economic partnership would be far off for us. So for us, at the moment, the quest is for a full dialogue partnership with ASEAN. Once that is achieved, it automatically takes care of, of a large number of membership of this comprehensive regional economic partnership, as well as China, with which we already have this FTA for long now, for almost 2007 onwards. So we have, of course, our economic experts are and trade experts are studying this subject. And we certainly look forward to see, I think there is some ban also on membership at the comprehensive economic partnership after ratification, probably initial two or three years, somebody else cannot join. 
So we have to wait and see where we can fit in and where we can find our own house in order about this subject and study the positives and gains and otherwise pros and cons, and then we'll certainly decide. But as Ambassador Jilani said, we have always welcomed such open trade agreements and entities, and we will someday wish to join it. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So let's let's work on having Pakistan as a dialogue partner first uh, on a ASEAN plus uh, framework. Dempsey, do you have one one more question before I ask my my final questions? Ah uh, yes. Uh, I I also want to I, I also want to hear the thoughts of. Uh, already mentioned that uh, that the. It is the intelligence initiative should be expanded to Asian to other Asian countries, so including the Philippines. Uh, for Ambassador Kazi, uh, I remember that the, our defense secretary here, Secretary Lorenzana, uh, expressed his concern more of uh, returning uh, Malaysians and Indonesian fighters. Uh, I think who are who were trained in other countries outside the ASEAN. Can I just ask, sir, uh, if you if you have if you will soon have any discussions with our defense secretary about it? I mean, I, particularly about the information sharing. I mean, I'm more concerned about that, and I also want to hear your thoughts about the recent advisory by Japan. You know, warning its citizens living in the Southeast Asian countries, and and I believe that those Southeast Asian countries are also your allies. So. I would like to hear your thoughts too. Uh, and Ambassador Gilani, I would also want to hear your thoughts. I mean, how concerning do you think this kind of uh, warning that Japan issued? And I believe Japan is also somehow an ally of Pakistan. Sir, I think uh, Mr. Luna is referring to this recent warning which was issued last Monday by the Japan's foreign ministry issuing an alert cautioning its citizens in Southeast Asia, particularly in those six countries, Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar, against possible terror attacks. And we have seen that the Armored Forces of Philippines spokesperson, Colonel Ramon Zegara, has said that as of now, we have not received any report, and we are constantly validating all reports on security matters, and it's a continuous process. So I, I think this is what you are referring to. Certainly, Pakistan has a, an excellent record of intelligence sharing with the, yes. with the Philippines. If you recall in my previous interview in April with your daily, mm -hmm. I had mentioned that I was pleased to hear during my credential ceremony that Honorable President, Mr. Duterte specifically mentioned of bilateral intelligence sharing cooperation between Pakistan and Philippines. So it's not only Philippines are in Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan is equally a great partner for us. And terrorism, as Ex Excellency Ambassador Jailani mentioned, is a subject beyond borders, beyond any, uh, any particular caste, creed, or religion, or ethnicity. It's, it's a global phenomenon, and we have to tackle it collectively. So Japan is also equally an important partner for us, and we certainly would share our intelligence with them, and we will seek them uh, um, anything that they have uh, concerns about this. But this particular warning is about this region, and we are really not sure on what basis Japan has issued this, but certainly there must be some background to this information. And uh, your country and authorities are well on it, and we hope that something positive will be shared with all concerned stakeholders. On our part, we are always there to share whatever we have, uh, to share with Philippines, with Indonesia, with Malaysia, and it has resulted in some positive developments and some curtailing of incidents across the region and the globe. As regards the other question, if uh, if you can may come again, please. You had. Uh, yes, uh, I, I believe our secretary uh, was. Yeah, Mr. Lorenzo's. Lorenzo. Uh, Mr. Lorenzo. Lorenzana, we have already finalized an MOU. I'm glad only a couple of weeks ago I have received the final text of the approved version of bilateral defense cooperation. And only thing is how to be signed. It should be signed technically between the ministers. But given the COVID related restrictions and issues, I think. Uh, Islamabad is asking me to have it signed at appropriate moment. And we look forward that once this MOU on defense cooperation is formalized, in turn formalized, we will have more cooperation in many fields, including joint intelligence sharing, counterterrorism, defense production related things, many things we discussed some of those in my previous interview with your panel. 
And so we look forward to have interaction on these fields. Yes, certainly in the near future. Yes. Ambassador well, Jilani, I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, no, no. I, sir. I, no, I think you have responded to both the questions. I thought that um, I will, um, you know, I'll just add that, you know, we have excellent cooperation with Japan also, as we have excellent cooperation with other countries in the region. We, um, we have intelligence sharing arrangement with them also. Our intelligence agencies, they have intelligence sharing mechanism with almost all uh, Asian countries. And I think we would be um, forthcoming in extending every possible assistance. I'm not sure, I'm, I, I think um, yeah, uh, that any such warning should be taken very, very seriously, even if it is based on sketchy information but then we can't uh, leave anything to chance. Uh, Japan has been a good development partner of Pakistan and we would not like anything or any such incident that would harm either the Japanese interests or the interests of other countries. Ambassador Jilani, I have just a couple of more questions if you don't mind about yeah. Afghanistan. Um, you, you said that it's important for, for the international community, particularly the West and the United States to, yes. to extend assistance. Um, what is what is a time frame that, that's in your mind? Is it is it something that 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 should be done immediately, or can the West afford to let it play out a bit more and and see what 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 uh, Afghanistan does with in, in forming a government? Well, I think the as I said that government formation, the inclusive government formation, or the coalition government formation, it is a very difficult process right. even for, for normal countries. Okay. So Afghanistan, it is only, um, it is less than a month that Afghanistan, that Taliban were able to take over the whole of uh, Afghanistan. I think we need to give them some time. We also need to show some patience. But at the same time, we also need to identify as to what are those basic things that the international community can do which can ameliorate the problems which are being faced by common man. The mm -hmm. common man is currently worried about its uh, salaries, its employment. They are worried about their basic needs, food, health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that is something that we need to be forthcoming, all of us, in helping Afghanistan. Right. Secondly, um, we also need to simultaneously try and build uh, the capacity of a foreign government. No, uh, um, the capacity building is something which is of paramount importance because unless we build their capacity uh, to expect them that they, they will be able to take uh, on um, uh, these terrorist organizations who are not sitting as, you know, in one group. They are not going to uh, come as a regular army right. and fight a regular war. It is again, uh, from their point of view, it's, um, you know, the kind of attack that they carried out on um, uh, last month, which, uh, you know, as a result of which many Afghan civilians and American soldiers, they were killed. So these are the kind of activities that they're engaged with that would also require strengthening uh, the intelligence of Taliban, the uh, also and the provision of other uh, know-how. I think these, all these things need to go simultaneously. My own, our own perception is that in case we help them, uh, it would create a lot of leverage vis-a-vis -vis Afghan Taliban. Uh, but without any leverage and without um, uh, and uh, any uh, creating any incentives that we will try and influence their thinking or their behavior, I think sometimes that becomes a little more mm -hmm. bit of a challenge as well. Is it fair to say that you know, I don't want I don't want to put words in your mouth? We should help them now. Is that is that what you're saying? We should saying? help them now. Yes. Okay. Yes. My, 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 my last question. I'm going to cheat a bit and ask you two questions in one. Uh, the first part is: Is there anything that, that surprised you about you know the, the the way the Taliban is conducting itself now? And then the second part of that is. What kind of government do you think we'll see? Will we see in Afghanistan? Is it going to, going to be more like the parliamentary system that we're that that you have in Pakistan, or is it going to be more of the style of government that we see in Iran, for example, where you where you have a religious leader overlooking the the, the government system? 
I think the um, we should not expect uh, the same kind of uh, system that you have or in our, we have in our country. Okay. Uh, we have a proper elected parliament. But I think the um, um, uh, your first question, what is what surprised me the most? If there's if there if there anything surprised you about the Taliban? Surprise. Yeah, I think the uh, one most surprising thing was number one that uh, uh, in the nineties when they had formed the government, they were not uh, they were media shy. Mm. They would not appear on uh, on media. Now you they're would, press conferences. You would never you would never see their pictures on television or in the newspapers, they would be, as a matter of fact, being <laughs> pictured was again something which was anathema to, uh, to Taliban in the past. But that's not the case anymore. So that is the number one surprise that uh, one encountered. The second surprise uh, that um, uh, I thought was that their willingness to, to allow um, women's education, because previously, the uh, pronouncements that they made in the 90s, it gave the impression as if they were against women's education at, you know, at all, but that's not the case. They have said that we would allow segregated women's education, keeping in view our social cultural norms, but the, the uh, you know, girls can receive education, primary level, secondary level, high, college level, and also up to university level. So that they need doctors, they need, this is what they have, they have said, and also, uh, other services which are essential uh, for women to take, to take part. So I think that is, and thirdly, I think uh, the general amnesty that they, they, they announced mm -hmm. for everybody, including their uh, bitter foes, is uh, also that was not expected. Uh, so that is again something which is very, very positive as far as the Afghan Taliban are concerned. Um, third, uh, they have um, announced that they would like to have good relations with all countries, um, and, you know, whether they supported them in the past or they opposed them in the past. So again, I think that is something which is a very, very positive uh, signal that has emanated from the Afghan Taliban. So, yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. Maybe just last, last question, right? Yeah. What, what do you think is the biggest misconception? You've been ambassador to the United States. Maybe I'm talking about that, that, that aspect of it. What do you think is the biggest misconception about the Taliban in Afghanistan, that, that that is not true, ba based on the facts that you as you see them. Well, the um, uh, there are still many countries um, who believe that um, uh, they can. Uh, well, the misconception about it that they they are not an entity which would accept any pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the uh, the some there are many policymakers around the world who think that by putting uh, pressure on Taliban uh, they will be able to modify their behavior. Uh, that has not been uh, proved right in the past twenty years. They have shows shown a lot of determination and resilience. And my our own feeling is that by only by talking to them by encouraging them. To take some more positive steps and to help by helping them, I think we, we would be able to change their behavior on so many other things as well. Well, thank you, Ambassador Jelani. Uh, Ambassador Kazi, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add uh, my own impression about the misconception. To me personally, again, it seems that well, some circles around the global centers do not believe still that Taliban could have changed. This is a perception, I feel like misconception about Taliban. Mm -hmm. Still there are quarters which wise things without looking into the ground realities, without into looking whatever in the past one month has happened in that mm -hmm. unfortunate country. And despite whatever the restraints by, by the Taliban, the way they had conducted in the past they have done, there is still a lot of misconception in many global art write-ups and articles I see that. Of course, we have yet to see. I'm not, uh, I don't hold a brief, are we not a spokesman for sure. Taliban? Sure. But what has to see yet what the conduct is to be. 
but they need to be supported to be, uh, as Ambassador Jailani said, some leverage somewhere on humanitarian issues at least. If you want women's rights to be protected, I have seen hospital scenes in Kabul, I see on Al Jazeera and other channels every day. There is not even basic paracetamol and you expect all the humanity, all the civilization, all their uh, countering the other terrorist entities around in that country. Lots of things need to be done on our part. And still we are not ready to have that misconception of 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we are still holding some in some parts of the world. That is the biggest misconception in my opinion, which needs to be at least with the passage of time, we need to see and judge and then modify our own thinking on this if we can judge it. The other thing about the Taliban Iran style governance, I've served twice in Iran. And some of the things I realized, they might be copying from the Islamic Republic of Iran. They might, this is again my personal perception. The way I saw young girls on the roads and the streets at some protests, even they are loaded first thing. In, that's in itself a big difference over the past Taliban and the new Taliban mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, Afghan Taliban. I saw those girls, like I used to see in Iran, the way they same way covered with this head scarf and the coat or mantu, they call it. Unlike the previous burqas, fully veiled, the Stone Age type braces and wheels that they used to have in the previous setup. So I found a similar change. They speak parts of 40% or 50% of Afghanis speak Persian language, Tajiks, Uzbeks. They have this Harat, they have their trade with Iran, they have culture. Par they they yeah. sing Hafiz, they, they say Saadi, the Bedal, the poets, the culture and folklore. So many things have in common with Iran, just as the Pashtuns have many things in common with Pakistani Pashtuns. Parts of the major parts of Afghanistan are have so much in common with Tajikistan and Iran. In terms, and then I saw the Iranians have the supreme leader. Then they have elected president. Now in this present setup also, they have introduced uh, Akhund, Mullah yes. Hassan Akhund as the supreme leader. They're not calling with supreme leader in Iran, they call it forever. But something similar, I, I, I tried to uh, address in this setup. I found that they might be trying to, of course they are in the evolution process. But there could be some elements from the system that is involved in Islamic Republic, which might be at the annual. Of course, they would not come the way as Ambassador Dinani rightly said, the parliamentary system of your government, uh, our government type. It, it, it's a lot of difference and gaps in our system that we will see there. They have their own systems of loya jirga and local consultation, their own, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. own governance styles for past many centuries and millennia. So they would be, of course, combined with the modern practices of Iran and some other places. And of course, their experience, the 20 years in wilderness that they have been. So they will pick up and they are showing some, some resilience and they are showing some adaptability. I was surprised to see the interview by their spokesperson with the lady, lady anchor on the TV late first time. And I was really surprised having taken over. This was also a news for me to see it, uh, that there is spokesperson and so diligently expressing his views, not in the, in the way they used to, we are known, Taliban are known to us. So I, I see some of the elements from the Iranian systems being copied at least at the moment. Let's see how it develops. And just one more thing I wanted to share while we have Ambassador Jilani spoke that we have been trying to send humanitarian assistance. Of course, we send them three plane loads uh, to Kabul, to Kandahar, Khost, and the last one to Mazar Sharif. Just now while having this interview, I received uh, one tweet from our special representative on Afghanistan, Mr. Mohammed Sadiq. He has served in Afghanistan as ambassador also, that today we have started large scale humanitarian supplies to Afghanistan through Turkham border. And Consul General of Pakistan in Jalalabad received 13 trucks of food items from Pakistan Afghanistan Cooperation Forum for dispatch to different Afghan provinces. This is the latest I wanted to share. Thank you, sir. Well, Your Excellencies, thank, thank you very much. I think if I can sum up today's uh, discussion, it is that uh, we should give Afghanistan a chance. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Your Excellencies, uh, Ambassador Jelani, Ambassador Kazi. Thank you again for your time. And please keep us in mind if, if there's another opportunity later on to uh, for you to give us an update on, on what's happening in in Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan. Thank you, Your Excellencies.